Thank you so much, Eric, and thank you so much, everyone, for being here. It is a distinct pleasure and honor, indeed, to welcome our guest today. Uh, for many Americans, indeed, millions of American households uh, have strong and vivid memories of uh, our guest uh, within just few weeks of the escalation of Russia's brutal invasion of Ukraine, um, flying all the way to the Grammy ceremony here in the United States and reading one of her poems at the Grammys, participating in a very moving and memorable tribute to Ukraine's bravery and honor uh, together with musician John Legend. But uh, Lyuba Yakimchuk has been a wonderful and very important voice bringing distinct experiences within Ukraine and also giving a very strong uh, representation to the diversity within Ukraine. There have been a lot of propaganda narratives coming out of the Russian government and its uh, mouthpieces that Ukraine is hopelessly divided and it is fractured, that it's not a real country. Uh, the voice that our guest brings is a testimony to the falsehood of those narratives. One of those propaganda talking points is that the east of Ukraine the area of where Russia uh, started its invasion, started in Crimea in March, and then a few weeks later in the east of Ukraine, in the region known as the Donbass, which is the of the next river basin, uh, that that is an area somehow not really Ukraine. We have a guest who represents that area. We have, I would say, uh, one of the greatest contemporary poets and this of Ukraine and it is a testimony to the strength and vitality of that area of the country and the richness of its Ukrainian culture that if you think of it over the course of the 20th century this is an area associated with some of the greatest names uh, like Volodymyr Susura who was called Black Ukraine became an unofficial alternative anthem like Vasily Skus, the great philosophical poet, equal to Rilke in the power of his insight, and the translator Rilke into Ukrainian. Somebody who was thrown not once but twice into the camps uh, by the Soviets, nominated for the Nobel Prize, but not receiving the Nobel Prize because he died in the camp in 85, when the show was already in power. We also have, as the native of the Luhanshtina, Sergei Jadan, another wonderful poet, prose writer, librettist, rock performer, and a wonderful rallyer for the cause of Ukraine worldwide, whom we have been honored to have as a guest here at KU a few years back. And I'm delighted to have Yuba Yekuchuk continue this tradition. We now can speak of more than nine years of many of the best names of outstanding, rich flowering that we have of Ukrainian literature and culture coming as visitors here to our university. Um, I'm glad to contribute my part to this. So Yuba was born in 1985 in Peromais. Uh, a small industrial city in the Luhansk region. Uh, for those of you who might not know where Kovalmaisk is, you may uh, remember the name of another city, Kovalmaisk, which was very much in the news, both in 2014 and more recently. And we've had visitors from Kovalmaisk here in the university for a few years back. These are twin cities located right next to each other. But the war in 2014 to die at Kovalmaisk was under Russian occupation of 
fast enough to stay that way quickly and have a control. Uh, Luba Yakinchuk is a graduate of Luhansk University, and she has been active on the Ukrainian poetry scene and recognized with awards going as far back as the year 2007, and has um, achieved probably the greatest recognition for the book that appeared in Ukraine in 2015, and then gave the title to this volume of selected posts that was published in a bilingual edition here in this country, Apricots of Donbass. Why apricot trees? Because apricot trees are deeply associated with the brain. And this is one of those sayings that we have in brain sometimes, that when you longer see apricot trees, you've left the home country. I planted an apricot tree in my backyard in Kansas City in recognition of that I missed the apricot trees from back home. And uh, so the poems from this collection in their diversity and variety in both the uh, intensity of feeling of getting the place, the voice, but also the impact of the horror of the war and the trauma that it has inflicted. There is one poem from that collection, Decomposition, that became a poem I think every Ukrainian knows and a lot of people around the world have also uh, reacted to strongly. This is a poem which talks about reality disappearing and language crumbling in a powerful symbolism linking each other. So we have a poet who very bravely and with great dedication has been helping the world to see the richness of Ukrainian culture and within Ukraine helping appreciate the regional diversity and the way Ukraine has been brought together in the wonderful world that she knows. In addition to her work as a poet, of course, she has been active in other capacities. And I especially would like to highlight here her wonderful script for the film Slovo, Nesakinja Verma, Slovo, an unfinished novel. And this is a film about a house, a cold house that Ukrainian writers of the 1920s Renaissance built in the city of Kharkiv. This is when, in the late 1920s, when we had a big renaissance of Ukrainian culture under Soviet rule, under this temporary policy of indigenization where there was a promotion of indigenous cultures of the many different ethnic groups within the Soviet Union, we've seen flowerings of national cultures, all these many groups that were formerly really brutally really repressed in the Russian Empire. It turned out that it was just a temporary retreat. Within a few years, in the 1930s, uh, the intellectual elites of Ukraine, of Belarus, of many other um, and sitting in parts of the Soviet Union brutally crushed by terror. The Slovo building, and Slovo means word in uh, Ukrainian, I believe over 80% of the people who live there were arrested and taken away. Many of them shot, and uh, many of them uh, perished in the world. Almost everyone was gone. So that building is a story of both the great flowering of talent, but also the tragedy of Stalin's terror. And now we have a moving rendition of that story that has come to film. And this film is now out. Uh, it's on the global festival circuit. And uh, I hope it will be receiving the recognition it deserves. And we're really grateful to our guests for contributing her voice and vision for making that film a reality. But I'm sure you have come here not to hear me speak, but to hear our guests speak. So, now, please join me in welcoming Luba Yakinchuk. Thank you, Vitaly, for this complex introduction. Thank you for having me here. And uh, Vitaly, today, you helped me uh, to be more sophisticated and to translate me. Uh, the, 
те, чим я сьогодні з вами тут сьогодні поділюся, це мої спостереження за тим, як російська культура, яку російські війська принесли в Україну, як вона вражає Україну і українську культуру. What I'm going to share with you today is some of my observation uh, on Russian culture as it was brought by the Russian army in Ukraine and how it is treated in Ukraine. Зараз перед собою ви бачите на цьому екрані Григорія Сковороду. Це український бароковий філософ, якому цього року виповнюється 300 років народження. In front of you you now see Григорій Сковорода. He is a great philosopher and poet of the Baroque era. This year actually marks the 300th anniversary of his birth. Так тепер виглядає музей Григорія Сковороди в Сковородиниці біля Харкова. Він зруйнований російськими ракетами. This is what the Григорій Сковорода museum in the village of Skovrodinivka near Datak and the place where he lived looks like Skovrodinivka is located near Kharkiv and the museum was destroyed by Russian shelling. Так виглядають тепер сотні музеїв, університетів, наукових установ, які зруйнували росіяни в Україні. This is how dozens, indeed hundreds of museums, um, universities, other cultural institutions all across Ukraine look like as a result of Russia's destructive efforts. Також росі, росіяни вилучають бібліотек і спалюють книжки, написані українською мовою. On the territories they have captured, uh, the Russian troops have been removing Ukrainian language books from libraries in Berlin. They also destroy monuments, uh, destroy monuments that are associated with Ukrainian history. And Curiously enough, they, uh, if there are monuments associated with uh, Russian or Soviet history, sometimes they just steal them. Why did I choose specifically the photo of Grigory Skovrod? This is a philosopher that is typical for Ukrainian identity because he is a philosopher of protest. During his lifetime, nearly 300 years ago, he uh, was uh, in invited and in fact strongly encouraged to join uh, the uh, ranks of uh, people associated with the Russian imperial rule, uh, specifically through the clerical world, but he refused. He said, uh, to me, my flute and my sheep are more valuable than the moral wreath from the Tsar. Григорій Сковороду кожен вивчає в школі, також всі учні знають про його ідею сродної праці, про те, що те, що ти будеш робити все життя, має відповідати твоїм бажанням, від того, чого ти хочеш. Григорій Сковорода є вчений в українській секундарі школі, і в addition to his poetry, people also learn about his concept of harmonious work, that you should be putting your efforts into something that you find that resonates with your soul. But let us uh, go back to what uh, Russians have brought uh, to Ukraine now, how Ukrainian language and Ukrainian literature are changing as a result of this war. If we look at the narratives that now dominate uh, the field of Ukrainian culture, not just literature, but cultural sphere more broadly, 
we can um, sing about two narratives: the narrative of tragedy and the narrative of comedy. А наратив трагедії це більш-менш зрозуміло. Ми переживаємо горе, ми горюємо за втраченими українцями. Ми оплакуємо зруйновані міста, і про все це ми пишемо або про все це говоримо. The narrative of tragedy is perhaps uh, easier to uh, expect. Uh, we go through our grief, we mourn, we mourn the Ukrainian lives lost, we mourn the cultural uh, great achievements that have been destroyed. But we also laugh a lot. We have a lot of uh, humorous stories about uh, Ukrainian resistance, about Ukrainian ingenuity, stories about how Ukrainians, you know, command, uh, commandeered uh, Russian tanks or the, uh, or armored vehicles, and how a farmer with a tractor was able to tow with a tank and things like that. А зараз ми переживаємо справжній вибух українського стендапу. При тому українські коміки всі перейшли з російської мови, раніше стендап був переважно російськомовний, на українську. And uh, also we now have the great revival, the great explosion of new work in Ukrainian stand-up comedy. It is truly flourishing. And interestingly enough, as a public genre, before February, uh, stand up comedy in Ukraine was done mostly in Russia. All the stand up comedians have now switched into Ukraine. Можливо, ви чули, що протягом останнього місяця росіяни ринуть українську електроінфраструктуру. You may have heard that, especially in the last month, uh, a lot of Russia's attacks have been aimed at Ukrainian electric infrastructure, uh, so uh, to clean the electricity delivery in the country. Uh, so uh, both uh, cruise missiles manufactured in Russia, but more recently also Iranian drones have been used for that purpose. Uh, do you know what kind of reactions on social media, what, like on Facebook, for example, or what kind of memes appear in Ukraine? Краще провести без електрики всю зиму, ніж провести все життя з росіянами. It's better to spend uh, one winter without electricity than to spend the whole life with the Russians. Під час бекауту ми будемо займатися коханням, робити дітей, якщо ми можемо вже працювати. If during blackouts we cannot work, we'll just uh, make love and bring new Ukrainian babies into this world. до того, як пережити цю війну. Це дуже вітальний підхід і дуже оптимістичний. І коли Ерік згадав, що я втомлена, я подумала, я українка, я, я не втомлена. Я лише confused. Okay, uh, so uh, this is our Ukrainian approach. It's the approach full of liveliness of energy and verve and resolve. So when Eric earlier on mentioned that I might perhaps be exhausted from all my travels, uh, I said, no, I'm Ukrainian, I'm not exhausted. I may be a little confused, but... This now could be a good uh, line on a resume or CV. Somebody's Ukrainian, therefore they have an extra set of skills. <laughs> Так, повертаючись до теми війни, ви зараз бачите, мем це американський мем, але він дуже яскраво передає те, що роблять росіяни в Україні. Coming back to the narratives about the war, I mean, there are a lot of memes. This particular meme actually is from this country, but it is a good rendition, a good way to understand what is happening with the narrative of Russian invasion in Ukraine. Це самі те, те, що росіяни нас дуже люблять, і тому вони прийшли нас рятувати. Це те, що вони говорили 
зовсім недавно цієї весни в Бучі. That uh, this is exactly what the Russian narrative was so that they love us very much and that's why they came here to save us and this is what they've been saying, say for example, this spring in Bucha. Uh, the narratives about uh, Russia's uh, fondness for the nations they occupy is actually not new. I mean, if you recall what Milan Kundera was talking about uh, uh, concerning Russian occupation of Czechoslovakia, I mean, he was using this very uh, imagery. Ці всі речі для нас людей, які не не живуть в російському суспільстві, виглядають дивними. І дуже часто в культурі і в літературознавстві їх визначають як такий концепт, концепт як загадочна загадочна руська душа. So this is something that uh, for those of us who live outside Russia's borders can feel strange and and leads up to the notion that it's not around the world, of the so-called mysterious Russian soul. So this is a cultural concept uh, to describe Russians who think that they are different from the rest of the world versus us, the rest of the world, who is supposed to be just fundamentally different from them. So how is this cultural difference manifested in the world in Ukraine? В Україні можливо відчули якісь із цих історій, але я спостерігала, що часто американці цього не знають, тому я все-таки це не збув. You may have heard about some of these stories, but I've noticed during my public talks in the US that some Americans were not familiar with them, so I will still name them and list them. Росіяни в Україні Окрім того, що вони ведуть там бойові дії і гвалтують, вбивають людей, депортують їх, або роблять речі, які прямо стосуються до війни, вони ще обкрадають українські будинки. І дуже цікаво подивитися, що вони кривають. In addition to all the violence, including murder, uh, rape uh, and torture of Ukrainians, uh, the physical destruction, we see a lot of looting of Ukrainian homes. And it's very interesting what are the things that are being looted. We seem to have a uh, projector problem, so bear with us. Uh, among the things that uh, were stolen and taken away uh, were toilets, microwave ovens, electric uh, kettles, sometimes if it's a two-piece kettle without the stand that the, the actual water bar goes on, sometimes even door handles. So it turns out that, that probably those are the things that uh, they have a shortage of in Russia. This uh, reality, uh, this, this realization is just so unexpected and shocking for us that in a sense we have a competition going on between literature and reality. Uh, 
And uh, in this competition, reality more or less wins because uh, there are many details that if you would have thought of them uh, being introduced in a literary work, they would be seen as truth, not truthful, as exaggeration, as a fantasy. Don't worry about this little point. Just to Працюю над таким ось текстом, або як лісь український предписменник працює над таким ось текстом. Мій текст десь тут, тут те, що роблять росіян в Україні десь тут. І нам дуже важко до цього дотягнутися. So when we, uh, when an Ukrainian writer, myself, or another Ukrainian writer works on a text, what I do is on this level, and what the Russian reality is on this whole other level, and it's very hard to work in this kind of situation. Ця поведінка не є якоюсь нетиповою, їхня поведінка в Росії не є якоюсь нетиповою, не є надзвичайною. Коли росіяни повертаються додому під час ротації, є докази того, є перехоплені розмови росіян і докази того, що вони квалтують жінок в Росії, в Білгородській області. And uh, this uh, behavior is not uh, something that is exceptional and out of the ordinary especially um, in a very surreal way, we have intercepted conversations that confirm that soldiers uh, coming back during troop rotations from Ukrainian territory, um, having been raping Ukrainians, they raped Russian women in the border regions of Russia as well. Недавно вышел такой документальный фильм, он называется «Сараевский сафари», режиссер Мира Зупанич. The recently uh, a documentary was released uh, by the director Miran Zupanich uh, called The Sarai was Safari. Uh, the uh, story of that film, the, the, the reality it investigates, is that during the siege of Sarajevo in the Bosnian war now nearly 30 years ago, some wealthy foreigners uh, paid a lot of money to the uh, Serb troops to have an opportunity to shoot live ammunition at the city from the Serbian positions that were besieging the city. Organizatori of this safari are the military army of the Russian Federation and the Serbian military. And those safaris were jointly organized by Serbian and Russian army. The uh, rates to pay uh, that safari were higher if you wanted actually to kill a child. На це сафарі приїздили також російські письменники, які хотіли набратися досвіду, зокрема Леонов і Захар Прилєвин. Uh, among the, those who participated in this safari, there were, among them were Russian writers, specifically uh, Eduard Limonov and Zahar Prilin. Uh, in feeling that they needed to develop uh, the Russian soul and the peculiarities of that Russian soul and to comprehend that they needed to have that experience. We already have an investigation that is going on about a similar safari, uh, this time without writers, there were only people in the military that the Russians organized in Bucha. That is that Russian reality, that Russian soul that they brought into Ukraine, and because of that, the reality 
changing. This is also having an impact in us Ukrainians, Ukrainian culture, and Ukrainian language. Кожна мова завжди відображає реальність. Ми створили люди, ми як люди створили мову для того, щоб описувати реальність зовні і описувати наші почуття і наші стосунки до реальності. Every language is a description of reality. Uh, human beings created language in order to explain reality outside and also explain their perception, their feelings and reaction towards that reality. Уже під час останніх років в Україні ми можемо спостерігати, як це впливає на українську мову. And in recent years, we have really been able to see those changes, those impacts on the Ukrainian language. Інколи слова змінюються протягом кількох місяців. Як, наприклад, слово «електрика» його значення змінилося кілька разів з 24-го лютого цього року. So, for instance, the meaning of the word «electricity» changed several times since February 24th of this year. Electrica, earlier, before this, Electrica was something that we always had and always had something that was usual in the building. Before then, electricity was something that was always there, something that we did not notice, something that was commonplace in the background and would come. З кінця лютого, коли почалася інвазія, українська влада просила нас маскувати наші місця, проводити електромаскування, вимикати, закривати наші вікна, вимикати електрику, коли на дворі темно. And since the invasion of Sunday in February, the Ukrainian authorities have called us citizens to in uh, the protection efforts to do electric masking that has turned off the lights uh, in the evening when we were home. Це було потрібно для того, щоб приховати наші місця від ворога, який знаходився зовсім близько. За 20 км, наприклад, від Києва стояли росіяни, а в Києві а за 20 км від них ми приховували наше світло, ми приховували електрику. This was happening when the Russian troops came very close. They were some 20 kilometers from Kiev, and in Kiev, 20 kilometers away from them, we were turning all electricity off, trying to protect ourselves in our city. So at that time, uh, electricity uh, in its meaning uh, became different for us. It became something dangerous. Зараз, коли українські міста страждають від блекаутів, електрика стала чимось таким дуже цінним, надцінним, тим, що нам дуже бракує. Now, when the Ukrainian cities are suffering uh, blackouts because of the uh, Russian destruction of the Ukrainian infrastructure, um, electricity became something super valuable, something that we feel the lack of, something that for which we have very strong feelings. Тобто писати про електрику до повномасштабного вторгнення під час першої фази і зараз це зовсім різні речі. So writing about something like electricity before February 24th, before the mass scale invasion, in the first months after the invasion, and in the current situation, creates very different meanings because of a very different context. Таких слів стало дуже багато. Наприклад, ванни і коридор перестали бути ванною і коридором. Вони тепер є безпечними місцями, де ми можемо ховатись під час обстрілів міста. There are many other words like that. For instance, bathrooms and hallways. I know all of you know bathrooms and hallways. Those are places where we hide. There are places of relative safety when our cities are being shelled. Деякі слова змінили своє когнітивне значення, наприклад, слово «вибух», яке зазвичай було чимось тільки небезпечним, зараз лише таким не є. Some words change their cognitive connotations. So the word explosion, for example, which signified something dangerous, now is no longer just that. Зараз ми розрізняємо два види вибухів. Хороші вибухи і погані вибухи. Now we differentiate between two types of explosions, good explosions and bad explosions. Погані вибухи 
це зрозуміло. Це вибухи від ракет, від снарядів, що падають в наші міста. It's understandable, but that explosions are these explosions that are coming from rockets, uh, artillery shells, and other ammunition that is falling on our cities. Хороші вибухи це вибухи в небі, коли летить російська ракета і її в небі збиває українське ППО. Uh, good explosions are explosions in the sky when a Russian rocket is flying and Ukraine uh, anti-air defense is actually able to intercept and destroy the rocket. Uh, we distinguish now the sounds of those explosions. They're quite different from each other. And even if you're far away you cannot see that just the difference in sound uh, creates a difference in your mood and difference in your reaction. You can be uh, happy or relieved because of one of them and extremely worried and anxious because of the other. Ще одне цікаве слово, і прийдемо до наступного пункту. Ще одне цікаве слово, яке у нас з'явилося, воно змінило теж, воно отримало додаткове значення, це слово бавовна, котон. And then there is another word that has uh, appeared in Ukraine and has really changed its meaning or acquired an additional meaning. This is the Ukrainian word for cotton, as in cotton, the plant, uh, Бавовна в Україні означає а, підривання або обстріли російських складів і, а, рос, ну, власне, інколи російських мостів. Бавовна в Україні зараз означає «блоїнг ап» російські амуніційні сторожі і інші російські інфраструктури, як російські бриджі. Це слово з'явилося через існування російського ефемізму для слова вибух. This word appeared because of the existence of a Russian euphemism for the word explosion. В Росії в медіа прийнято називати вибухи не не взрив, називати їх хлопок, клеп. So in uh, Russia, uh, in Russian media when they refer to explosions that happen on Russian territory, they avoid using the word explosion, observe in Russia. Instead, they use the word for a clap, a clapping sound, which is хлопок. Вибух газу в будинку, який зніс пів будинка, у них називається хлопок газу. Вибух складів зі зброєю, у них називається хлопок теж. So when an explosion happened uh, because of poor infrastructure maintenance, when a natural gas explosion destroys half of an apartment building, they've called it a clap sound of, uh, of gas. When uh, an ammunition uh, depot it was blown up, they also described it as a clap sound. Uh, розігнати якийсь наратив в соціальних мережах, часом вони використовують Google Translate, щоб писати українською мовою. Uh, when uh, Russian uh, operatives were trying to develop certain trends in uh, uh, to impact uh, Ukraine, to create a certain wave uh, in social media, for instance, they often use Google Translate to translate from Russian to Ukraine. Uh, because of the omograph, these are words with different stress, but the same spelling, one is stressed in the first syllable, one is stressed in the last syllable. If you just type the word in the Google Translate from Russian to Ukraine, it will translate it as cotton novel. А власне, завдяки цій помилці ми почали називати ті вибухи, які відбуваються в Росії, бавовною. Uh, 
for explosions. То есть, когда вы выбираете на своей правильной машинке режим бавовна, вы трошки наближаете нашу правую. So when we select the car to the washing regime, uh, the washing machine, you're bringing our victory a little bit closer. <laughs> <laughs> Це зміна значення ненормативної лексики. Another thing that happened in Ukraine is a difference in meaning of curse words. Коли довкола відбувається щось таке надзвичайно стресове, люди для того, щоб трошки розслабитись, використовують все більше і більше ненормативної лексики. Це нормально. Uh, when really stressful things are happening around them, people to relieve the stress swear a lot. This is okay. This is this happens. Вы напевно знаете эту историю с фразой российский военный корабль иди на иди нахуй, когда россияне запропонували украинцам на острове украинским вискомбилом на острове Змеиного сдаться, они, власне, так ответили. Uh, you may have heard uh, early in the Russian escalated invasions when the Russian Navy uh, demanded uh, the Ukrainian uh, border guards on the Serpents Island, on the Zmini Island, to surrender. This is precisely what the border guards uh, answered. Russian warship, go fuck yourself. <laughs> І після неї почалися інші зміни, наприклад, на українських дорогах. This phrase became very popular in Ukraine, and after that other changes started happening in Ukraine, for instance, on Ukrainian roads. Тут на цьому екрані ви могли зараз би побачити знаки на дорогах, на яких написано «нахуй», «на Росію нахуй» і так далі. Тобто на українських дорогах на весні ми зняли всі знаки, які там були, і замінили їх на всі. If the projector were with us, you would have seen now some traffic signs that appeared in Ukraine in springtime when Ukrainians removed on various roads and highways direction signs and instead in the directions were saying Fucking back to Russia, <laughs> fuck off here, fuck off there. So it's something that was absolutely unimaginable until February. Ah, справа в тому, що російські солдати вони не мали з собою мобільних телефонів. Їм заборонили з собою в Україні брати мобільні телефони, і вони користувалися тільки паперовими мапами. Відповідно, ця зміна знаків на дорогах могла їм допомогти повернутися додому. Uh, the thing is uh, that uh, early invasion Russian soldiers were banned from using mobile phones and uh, they were only allowed to use paper maps and if they got confused those road signs would help them to come back home. <laughs> Лексика стала такою звичайною в Україні зараз, що ми не забороняємо своїм дітям, якщо вони говорять про російських окупантів або про Росію, використовувати негативну лексику. Curse words became so unexpectedly ordinary in Ukraine since February that now we don't even scold our children if they use them if it pertains to Russia and the Russian language. Ми розуміємо, що це допомагає також нашим дітям не використовувати насильство фізичне, а розслабитися за допомогою використання цих слів. Ми також розуміємо, що використовувати слова може бути вирішення, вирішення вирішення фізичної віленції, це вирішення стрес в іншій діречі, включно для діалогів. Українська мова почала допомагати боротися з росіянами і виявляти диверсійні групи на цій війні. Ukrainian language started fighting and helping to find Russian saboteurs in this war. Найпопулярніше запитання на українських блокпостах – скажи слово «паляниця». One of the most popular 
questions at the Ukrainian checkpoints is asking the person to say the word Palanitsa. But the movement is around, it's around bread. It's, it's, yes, it's a round loaf of bread, um, country style bread. Yeah. Yeah. А справа в тому, що українці, україномовні українці і і російськомовні українці можуть сказати це слово без помилок. The thing is that Ukrainians, both those who speak Ukrainian as a first language, but also those who speak Russian as their first language, but are exposed to Ukrainian, familiar with Ukrainian, they can pronounce this word without errors. Росіяни не можуть вимовити це слово, тому що там поєднання твердин, які твердий, і для них це дуже складно. It is uh, next to impossible for a uh, Russian speaker who has not been exposed to Ukrainian language to pronounce this word without an error because the combination, the sequence of using palatalized and non-palatalized consonants within it is a ve it's very much breaking the logic of Russian phonetics. А такі слова вони називаються шиболетом, і а вперше такі така вправа пов'язана з військовими згадується в книзі в Біблійній книзі суддів. Тобто це вже відомо в історії. And these kind of words uh, that are called shibboleths are actually something that are mentioned in the Old Testament in the Book of Judges. So this ignis Ukrainians are not doing anything new; they're following an age-old custom. Uh, я тут вам хотіла ще показати графік, йдеться про соцопитування, зроблене в кінці літа цього року групою рейтинг uh, про використання українська, українцями української мови. Як це було і як це змінилось? I also wanted to show you the results of, a, uh, of an opinion poll that was done by the rating agency uh, about the usage of Ukrainian language what were the trends before and how those trends change. В цьому дослідженні йдеться про те, що в Україні кожен п'ятий, 19% українців перейшли з російської мови вживання, йдеться про мову, яку вони вживають вдома на українську. Since February, since this um, escalated invasion, 19% of the adult population of Ukraine, so nearly every fifth person, uh, switched their language. Those were people who used uh, to use Russian as their primary language and they switched to Ukrainian. Розмовляють тільки українською в Україні 51% людей, тільки російською, і Okay, so 51% of the Ukraine's population now uses Ukrainian only in everyday communication. Two uh, 34% of the population uses both Ukrainian and Russian in everyday communication. And 13% of the population uses Russian only. У мене є сусіди, які розмовляли російською мовою до 24 лютого. I have neighbors back home who spoke Russian until February 24th. 24 лютого це родина, в якій чоловіки працюють в СБУ. 24 лютого вони прокинулись і сказали, чому ми маємо розмовляти російською, ми хочемо розмовляти українською, і перейшли на українську мову. In this family, actually, the man worked for Ukrainian uh, security services, and uh, it was it dawned on them on February 24th. Why exactly were they speaking Russian in everyday life? So we can switch to Ukrainian, and they did. Це дуже популярна історія зараз. Зараз чергова хвиля переходу українців на українську мову. І це можна простежувати також в соціальній мережі. This is something that has been happening over uh, the course of recent history in waves. So, uh, in the aftermath of the long-held tendencies of Russification under Russian Empire and Soviet rule, we see gradual waves of more and more percentage of the local population is switching to using Ukrainian as their language of choice. And this, this is very not noticeable in social media, for example. 
Дуже популярна річ, і це показує нове дослідження про те, що українці, які переходять на російську мову, для яких російська мова, по суті, є другою, вони, які переходять на українську мову, для яких українська мова, по суті, є другою, вважають, що вони почали говорити рідною мовою. What is interesting is that actually in the opinion polls we see folks say that those people for whom Russian was the first language and Ukrainian was a language they learned, they now say that Ukrainian is their main language, Ukrainian is their first language, so they changed their own definition of what their first language is. I am from the Russian language. Мої мама та тато говорили все життя зі мною, там, все свідоме життя зі мною російською мовою. I do come from a Russian language speaking family. My, both my mom and dad spoke Russian to me uh, all the life, my conscious life that I've been aware of. Я є перша людина в моїй сім'ї, яка почала говорити українську знову, і яка uh, навчила I was the first in my family to come back to the Ukrainian language that of other previous generations and the first one to teach my son Ukrainian. Це було ще до 2014 але я також вважаю українську мову своєю рідною. І я пам'ятаю дідуся і бабусю, які говорили українською. But I also consider Ukrainian my native language. I remember my own grandparents who spoke Ukrainian to me. А так було все влаштовано в Радянському Союзі, що ти не мог не міг зробити кар'єру. Якщо ти не говорив російською мовою, і тому люди були змушені користуватися мовою Москви, мовою Метрополії. The situation in the Soviet Union was such that if you wanted to have a successful professional career, if you wanted to be upwardly mobile in society, you had to use Russian. You had to use the language of the colonial metropolis. В Україні дуже цікаве ставлення до мови. Воно дуже сильно відрізняється від того, що є в Росії. І я, на мою думку, це пов'язано також із політичною культурою в наших країнах. In Ukraine there is a very different attitude to language uh, compared to Russia and I think that this attitude to language reflects uh, the difference in political cultures between our two countries. Навіть якщо подивитися і проаналізувати українську літературу, ми побачимо, як багато вірок є в цій літературі. І окрім того, в цій літературі є мікс українсько-російського слушання. If you look at Ukrainian literature, you see how many different dialects, how many different regional styles of speech are represented. And we also have the representation of this mixed patois, a mixture of Ukrainian and Russian that is called suzhuk. All of those things are not just referred to, but actually represented, examples are presented in the Ukrainian literary texts. Якщо подивитися на сучасну російську літературу, ви побачите переважно російську літературну мову. Там немає цього діалектного багатства, яке є в українській літературі. If we look at contemporary Russian literature, by and large, we only see standard Russian literature. You will only see standard Russian. You will not see the kind of regional diversity of dialects that you see in Ukraine. Мені тут йдеться про таку структуру. Російське суспільство влаштовано вертикально. Це вертикальна структура, коли в тебе є начальник, якому підпорядковується всі. This is to me a reflection of Russian political culture, which is 
based on what they call the vertical of power, when there is a boss, when there is a person at the top, and others are subordinate to them. Логічно, що в цій культурі має бути домінантна російська літературна мова. І треба згадати, що в Росії є закон, який також забороняє використовувати нормативну лексику, навіть в літературі. І це натурально, що це відповідає на те, that there is a very standardized version of Russian literary language that is used in public, and there are indeed rules and regulations that ban the use of specific forms, including, for instance, curse words, including in literary texts. But in its political culture, Ukraine is a horizontal society. Якщо нам ми вважаємо, що наша влада не представляє наших інтересів, ми йдемо на майдан. If we come to the opinion that our the people in power do not represent the interest of our nation, we come out in public squares. Кожен українець почувається так, що він має якийсь вплив, і мова кожного. A Ukrainian person feels that they have impact, and therefore they believe that their own individual voice, their own individual manner of speech, are also important. Literature only shows the unity. Literature and language too. Language of literature and literature more broadly are what only reflects and represents. Those diversity. Це основні відмінності, які зараз сталися в українській мові, в українській культурі, і які зробили з одного боку наслідок складність для для письменників, з іншого боку, які є дуже цікавими. These are the changes that have happened in Ukrainian language lately. And these changes, of course, made the work of writers often much more difficult, but also made it much more interesting, much more exciting. I would be very happy to answer questions as we might have.